what has these pebbles got to do with the Nazi war effort in the Second World War? Let's go find out. Way back in 1940-41, when Hitler opened the second, second front up, when he attacked um, Russia in Operation Barbarossa, June of 1941, um, and the Americans came in the war around right about the 7th of December, when they were attacked by at Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, Hitler declared war on them on the 11th of December, I think it was, 1941. He decided that he couldn't afford to um, defend two fronts, so he started to form the Atlantic Wall. Now, in order to form the Atlantic Wall, he, needs, he needed a lot of concrete, and part of that concrete needed to be um, aggregate or stones. So he found the ideal place to get good quality pebbles from a place called Tredernec in the um, west coast of France. So he set up a pebble crushing uh, plant in order to get as much of these stones as possible so that he could uh, carry on with his Nazi war effort and use these stones to mix with cement and make concrete so he could build the Atlantic uh, Wall. So I'll come along and have a look at um, what he set up. So what you see in front of me is three silos. Now these three silos are to hold the stones before uh, they were dip distributed along a, a carriageway, a railway that was running along here towards a place called Quimper, which is a bit further up there. And um, all the stones were falling to there and basically they were being to like a silo, which is these here, and then dropped into carriages and taken off and then they were distributed from the National Railway to the, um, to the uh, Atlantic Wall. What you see in front of me is a um, is a uh, 150 meter by 25 meter high by two meter thick wall. Now it does two things. This wall, it gives it some protection uh, from the sea and the wind because the sea is to the left of me over there, a few hundred meters, and also on that far end there, the uh, there was a carriage that ran down to the uh, the sand or to the pebbles uh, was loaded up by um, by um, diggers and they would then come along here, come the across the top of here and they would park on top of there. Now then, what would happen then was these little things sticking out there, they had, uh, they had sort of things called, well I think they were called sieves, they were like a big sieve and what they'd do is they would get the truck full of pebbles, they'd be tipping inside there and the sieve would sort out the big pebbles from the little pebbles. There'd be a railway line, I'm assuming, running across here, this way. Now them smaller pebbles could go straight to the um, to the railway lines over in towards Quimper and then turn to the Atlantic Wall, but the bigger pebbles uh, they would have to be crushed down to manageable sizes. As you can see there where the little uh, holes are in the wall, this is where the sieves would have actually sat. The other pebbles would have been sent into a machine over here. Which I think the middle bit there is a pebble crushing plant, or it was at one time, it's been stripped out now. Pebble crushing plant would have crushed the pebbles to manageable sizes, they'd have been conveyor belted up into these silos there for storage. The two silos uh, held 300 um, square metres of um, aggregate. This one here was a was a uh, a, uh, a spur one. Right, in this silo, you can see the holes there and the holes there. Um, obviously, when the tr the um, cat was underneath, they'd have brought them silos up there and they'd have dropped the stones in. That middle section there, I'm only guessing that's where the uh, crushing machine would have been, and then conveyor belts would have taken it up to the top, to the uh, the top of the silos and dumped there until um, they waited the uh, carriages to go underneath and start to load them up. This is I'm. Uh, it's possible 
that uh, this here is one of the um, buildings that would have held the mortars or the crushes there to crush all these stones, little pebbles into stones, into aggregate. Well, somebody's kindly opened the fence up. It ain't me. Right, I can have a quick walk round here and see what's here inside this um, this mega structure. I was about the silo anyway. As you can see, it's going up. That's got to be 25 metres high, I reckon. This um, block of concrete with these uh, two metal um, um, fixings, I wouldn't be surprised if that had some kind of conveyor belt on it of such to take um, to take the uh, the chippings right up to the top and get them stored inside these silos. That looks like the engine room, to be honest with you. Well, you see the rebar that's been exposed. That's over time that. The concrete structure is rotting away. Now, where I am walking now, there would have, there would have been a railway line run to the end of that. The, that looks like the one that, because um, it's slightly away from the rest of them, that's what that's the extra storage. Obviously I don't know what that is, that I've got a feeling again could be a, a, a mounting for conveyor belts or some kind of mortar. You can see just where the uh, telephone communication uh, brackets are. They would have been more likely linked to probably the uh, the Atlantic Wall Front, or definitely to the railway stations. To say that you've got uh, X amount of pebbles, or I should say aggregate, ready for you to take. The building with the graffiti at the front, that one there, that uh, is more than more than likely the uh, the way into the um, the actual motor works. Probably steps as well to go to the top and have a look at what's going on regarding um, any motor that's running, or I'm only assuming it's the motor that's in there anyway. The building that you can see there, that's more than likely the entrance into the uh, the engine room, I would assume. Uh, there's more likely steps up there to the top, uh, the, uh, and then overlooking here, if the engine was there, more than likely some kind of... Um, I'm not sure what that all would be there, maybe something to do with the conveyor belt system or whatever. The crusher plant could have either been there, or it could actually be that was actually on the earth itself, on that section there. Um, I don't know if you know anything about concrete, but um, pebbles don't really work well with um, concrete, because pebbles are smooth, and when it's smooth nothing can really grab hold of them. If you've ever been to a race track, and I, I used to do race marshalling many years ago for motorcycles, uh, a place called Ulton Park in the UK and, and a few other places, they have um, pebbles um, just off the corners of each corner of the race track. And the idea is, is uh, they call it kitty litter, because if something hits it, it doesn't actually stick and grab. You can walk on it and you, it doesn't compact. Now, because it doesn't compact, it, it makes it easier. If somebody like, comes off, they'll basically skip across the actual pebbles itself. Now then, so this is one of the reasons why pebbles are no good for concrete. Now, once they've been crushed up, like this machine would have been crushing them up, it has turned out something like this. Can you see how uneven they are? These make it perfect for mixing with um, sand and cement to make um, concrete. Another thing as well, because these pebbles are from the seaside, they need to be washed first really. So I'm assuming there must be some kind of um, 
uh, freshwater washing facilities. Now, the other side over there, there's actually a couple of ponds. Now, whether they've actually put them in there to wash them first, get rid of the salt, I don't know. But um, they have to get rid of that salt because what happens is, when you mix um, salt with metal, especially rebar, then it starts to react against it. It makes the actual structure weaker. So it needs to be washed before they, uh, before they use it. Oh, it's windy today and it's raining. Right. The wall here, as I said before, what it was built for, mainly initially, was to um, give it some protection from the sea and the weather because the sea is just the other side of this wall. And uh, obviously run that railway track up to put the sieves up at the other end to filter these small little pebbles uh, away from the much bigger ones that would need to be crushed. On the other side of this wall, he built some fortifications, some bunkers and a bunker system and an and a, and a, a alleyway between them. So we can have a look at the outside. I don't think we can get on the inside, but we'll have a look at it. The reason he built that was because he obviously feared that uh, the Allies would probably attack down this end, especially attack from the sea. That appears like a chimney stack. Now, if that's a chimney stack, obviously there have been uh, manned quarters for soldiers uh, guarding this position. In 1944, they reckoned that uh, there was a 700 metre long pile of pebbles waiting to be either crushed or they were ready for being shipped out. I've got a feeling they went to be crushed, otherwise they'd been shipped out through them. The big silos there, um, which equated to something like 93,000 cubic metres. Now, at the end of the war, um, the French used this site, they carried on crushing the pebbles, and they actually used all the aggregate to rebuild Brest, which was completely destroyed um, in the Second World War. Uh, in 1948, they closed this plant, it was never used again. This is one of the casemates, and uh, I've heard it's got a Tobruk in it, which basically is a machine gun or motor position at the top of it. Um, that looks as though, facing the back, there was some kind of uh, possible uh, rear guard, just in case the uh, Allies attacked from the, from the rear. This here is actually a Tobruk. Basically, the, the Tobruk was named after uh, the town of Tobruk, actually, in North Africa, when Rommel held it at one point. Uh, it must have been um, the soldiers decided to cut that, I don't know. But um, I'll show you the top, if I can. We'll walk around and have a look at... Uh, it's all sealed off, anyway. Right, this section here would have been an open uh, encasement. If it had been open up here, you'd have had a machine gun in there, or a mortar, in other words, so it had not 360, it had 180, so it would, from round here, all the way across here, so it covered this whole section. But I'm still on the top of the embankment where the railway line would have come along. Going down there, I don't know if you can see or not, but the sea's just there. Uh, that's where they got the pebbles from, and uh, have gone that way. Obviously over time it's sort of dilapidated. There's uh, sand there now and it obviously part of it's worn away but we'll walk uh, partly on the top of the, uh, the actual wall if we can. I'm walking along the wall where the railway would have come along full of pebbles from the beach. It'll have turned it along here and we'll go partly onto this, uh, on the top of this wall. Right, we're on top of this wall. Now, it might be a bit too dangerous for me to walk right on the edge of it because this wind's got me 40, 50 mile an hour winds, it's blowing me sideways. But uh, you can see the things on the wall here, about two metres. I can't go any further than that, which is obviously silly anyway. But that's what would have happened. Got across there, stopped, tipped its load in. Onto the onto the uh, the sieves, or whatever they're called, and then uh, the rest, as I said before, the smaller pebbles would have gone straight to the uh, local railway, and then onto the um, front line of the Atlantic Wall. The rest would have been uh, put into uh, crushers over there, and then conveyed up into these silos. Silo there, ones at the back. And then the one over there is just basically uh, anything that they couldn't fit in the other two silos. Well, that's the back end of the wall. Um, 
this wall's partly faced, well, it's just faced the sea actually. That's the original wall that was built in order to take the railway car to the top. This lump here is the defensive section built after around about 1942. It'll be nice to hear me because uh, the wind's been howling up there, it's so windy. Uh, a bad day to turn up really. I was going to fly the quad or the drone if you want to call it that. Uh, but it's just too windy so hopefully I've got to break in the uh, break in the weather tomorrow morning about 6 o'clock so we're camping on the car park just over here. So tomorrow morning I'll get up and try and find the quad, quad around it. it. It'll be a different person, uh, a different aspect to what you're looking at regarding this pebble crushing plant. It's quite a unique uh, structure this. I've never seen one of these before. I've never even heard of it. It's not been on any channels where I can find. Uh, the only, I'm not even sure I've found it to be honest with you. But um, I know that um, the only site that's got some information on is a French site and I've had to get Google to translate it so it's translated as best it can but I've picked most of the information up anyway so hopefully I've, uh, it's come across okay for the people that are watching it. What you see in front of me is a, is a casemate uh, and there's also one about 100 metres that way as well. Now, they were built, designed in a certain way, the box was built at a sort of, at a cross member, or I should say at a sort of 45 degree angles. In other words, what they're trying to do is create a firing zone, if anything's attacking it this way, so both guns will be covering uh, like a sort of this area here. Now each one of these casemates held a 75mm pack gun, which is an anti-tank gun. Uh, at the back of this, along here, which you can't see, there's a hundred metres of a corridor, plus other buildings behind as well, no doubt to house uh, soldiers in case of attack, they obviously could come out and then open fire on anybody who was attacking the, uh, uh, attacking the, this area here. This is the other case, mate, I know it's difficult to see what, uh, how it worked, but if you look at that one there, how it's handled, facing that way, this one would be the same. Now, I'm not going to the beach, it's just, um, it, it's actually, I'm sheltered down here, it's not too bad up there, it's windy as anything, we're on the beach. You've also got some more um, uh, block houses and casemates. Um, there was light anti, there was light anti-aircraft um, gun, there was um, group shelter, there's also a, a, a 167 a five centimetre anti-tank emplacement. Now they're all given names like uh, 134, 501 and 667 because when they were building the Atlantic Wall uh, they had names called Regal Bow. So in other words if they for instance wanted a group shelter they would ask for uh, the uh, diagram and the plans for a, a 622 or something like that. What they do then was they would they'd know exactly how many man hours it would take, how many men it would take, how much concrete, how much rebar they could use to build that particular um, blockhouse. So in other words, the Germans, typical Germans, everything was calculated virtually to the to the millimetre. But that's how they did it. Now this blockhouse, uh, which is obviously at the end of the wall, was a, it was a built to uh, it was a garage. You can't get in there now, you can see that the entrance is just, you can't, it's just sort of, sort of, uh... Well I hope you like my little um, video regarding the history and um, the construction of this uh, pebble crushing plant and what it was all about from the 1940s and um, I hope to see you on the next video. So I'll see you again then, bye!